Hi, my name is Ronan Bree and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Applied Sciences at Dundalk IT. And today I want to show you a submission as part of the Year 3 project module from a student that highlights some best practice uh, in academic writing. And I think if you go through the, the, the elements that I'm going to show you now and kind of really learn those kind of tips, I really think that will help you with your own submissions in the future. This student's literature review focused on a specific treatment for cancer. Um, the student had done a lot of background research and the student was able to paint a picture of all these different types of drugs that could be used, but really focused in on one that her research had guided her towards and she developed that more and more throughout the literature. So you'll see uh, as I bring you through her literature review some of the key things I think are worth highlighting for someone about to start the process. I'd also like to acknowledge that student um, the student kindly has uh, volunteered to talk through her approach and how she addressed writing her literature review. So I hope you'll find that a little bit helpful. And then after she speaks, I'll highlight myself in the, in the review, in the document, some of the key things. So you can reflect on those as you begin to, to start your literature review process. So I'm going to introduce the student now. Um, and I hope you find her presentation beneficial. And then afterwards, uh, as I said, I'll continue on with the analysis of the document. Writing a literature review can be very daunting, so my approach was to break everything down into little steps. Initially, I just picked a very general topic that I was truly interested in, in my case cancer, an area I had recently heard about and found fascinating were telomeres. So in order to zone in on a narrow topic, I simply researched telomeres. At this stage, I didn't really look at scientific papers, but rather news articles, summary articles, etc. Just something to give me an overview of the topic. This way, I came across different approaches to using telomeres and an enzyme called telomerase in cancer therapy, and I felt I wanted this to be the topic of my project. Now that I had a better idea of the content of my literature review, I started looking at scientific papers. To start off with, I mainly focused on recent review papers, just to get an overview of the topic, recent findings, and learn about the background. I set myself the target to read at least three papers a week. This included reading the papers, highlighting main points, and starting to summarize paragraphs and sections in my own words. For example, I'd read a main section, put the paper aside, and then summarize what I had just read in one or two sentences. This saved me a lot of time later on when I actually started writing my review. I also started to highlight papers referenced in the review articles, especially research um, articles that would come in handy later. I mainly used the Science Direct Database, PubMed and Library Database for my research. If I had a specific interest, I'd also sometimes use Google Scholar. After about three weeks of reading and getting a better understanding of the topic, I started to create a table of contents. Really, I used this to get an idea of the different sections I wanted to include and what I wanted to focus on in the end. I kind of looked at it like an inverted triangle. Start um, off very broad, introducing the topic, giving a background on the subject, and starting to lead the reader in a more specific direction. For background info, I also used science books. For example, in my case, I started off with the background of cancer and how it affects cells and changes healthy cells leading to telomeres and telomerase, the associated role and problems in cancer cells, which led me then to talk about a few hand-picked general approaches and therapies that use knowledge of telomeres, and then focusing on one particular drug that I was really interested in. While the sections and titles of the contents changed throughout uh, writing my review, this approach gave me a real good way of planning and writing my review and letting me set goals, such as either writing X amount of words uh, per week or finishing a certain sections, etc. As my research intensified and I really had a good understanding of the topic, I would also focus more on research papers. Review papers are great to get a summary of a topic, but research papers allow better insight into the topic and allow you to evaluate the research, critical thinking, where should the researchers go next, etc. It's important to include these types of papers into your research too. This also allows a better understanding on how to evaluate your research and your papers. You learn how to differentiate between good and bad papers, etc. Only after several weeks of writing did I start to read the document as a whole and started to pay attention to the flow. Initially, I would put everything that came into my head down. Now was the time to consider what was important and what redundant. I tried to use linking words to create a better flow, like similarly or in addition. 
um, to link sentences or conversely or however to link sentences sections that were in disagreement. I only thought about the title when the document was pretty much wrote. Um, as you go along, things will change quite a bit, so I didn't want to waste time on the title beforehand. It is basically a one-sentence summary of your review and focuses on the question you are trying to answer. All that was left then was to read through the document over and over again. This can't be done often enough, and I'd also recommend giving it to someone else for grammar and spelling issues, but also to see does it make sense, does it flow well, and is it easy to read. I hope some of these tips will be helpful to you and best of luck with your review. I just thought it'd be nice at this stage to kind of highlight some of the key things that I noticed from literature review. So um, when this was submitted, one of the first things I saw that's really good is a table of contents. And it's, it's quite obvious to have this, but if it's simple and designed right, you can actually get a kind of a road planner or a route planner for, for the actual review. And you know where the, the review is going to take you from a reader point of view. Interesting to highlight what she mentioned as well, that she started off very general at the beginning. She starts off with how cells grow. She gets into particular problems and processes in the cell and a particular protein that she's going to focus on. And then she talks about that protein and how it can be stopped from functioning. And she gives examples of how that can be performed. So all of a sudden she's gone from being very general at the beginning to much more specific towards the end. If I bring you to page four, um, just want to highlight here her very beginning she commences here with a quote so she opens up everything with a general quote and starts off quite general again as she mentioned and as we saw on the table of contents at the very beginning she talks about how um because the process she's looking at is to do with stopping cancer cells from growing but starting off with a quote can often be something that can be a nice way to set the scene if i move to page eight Here, it's what I like is that at the end of this section, the end of this introductory section, she says, in the following overview, the growth and proliferation of normal cells will be discussed, as well as how these processes differ in cancer cells. Furthermore, the role of telomeres, the highly conserved regions of DNA at the end of eukaryotic linear chromosomes in normal and cancer cells will be examined, as well as the importance of telomerase enzyme in the maintenance of telomere length, particularly in cancer cells. Additionally, this review will look at the different approaches to telomerase inhibition with a particular focus on the novel therapeutic treatment in Mittelstadt. Finally, a short conclusion will be given. So this statement at the end of the introductory uh, you know, section really does map out for me as a reader what's coming and it kind of links them to the next section. I know where we're going to go and I find that's quite, uh, quite helpful at the end of an introductory section. If we move forward to page 11, at this stage is going to try and introduce a key player in the process, a particular protein known as P53. So certain reviews can just name it and continue with the, the work and not describe it. And you see here, she states that P53 is another important protein that's thought to be affected in most, if not all human tumors by either harboring a mutation in the P53 gene itself or mutations being present in proteins that control the activity of P53. She talks about the, this protein is important in tumor suppression as it stimulates cell cycle arrest in G1 and G2 and so on. So I just want you to see that she really did introduce P53. She didn't kind of just mention it. Even though it's not the focus of the review, it was still important that she did in this section and she introduced it quite well. And that helped this section um, kind of flesh out that information. So if we move to page 12, I think what's really nice here is that she sets the context in this section historically very well. She goes back to 1961 when she mentions Leonard Hayflick and Paul Moorhead discovering that cells could only divide a certain number of times. And it's so important to make sure that we include key seminal authors, as in the really important people who started the research. Um, Yes, I, I, we have to keep up to date and we do need all the important new references, as you see, 2006, 2004, um, to in, your, in your reviews. But it's so important that the main people are still recognised. So she sets the scene very well here and I thought that was worth capturing on this. If I bring you to page 14 um, here with the end replication problem. When she says the end replication problem and introduces it, she says, comma, first independently described by the scientists Alexei Olovnikov and James Watson, comma, 
illustrates how with every DNA replication, some basis at the very ends of chromosomes gets lost, thereby shortening the telomeres until the Hayflick uh, limit, which you mentioned earlier, is reached. But I just really like this idea here. She stated something and then provided a comma and had almost a mini piece of information that helps, adds more kind of what, um, information or depth to this particular statement. And that's something you can use quite uh, routinely, but it's very, very effective when it's used in the right way. If I bring you then, if we skip to page 20 for a minute, um, just want you to see a little bit about setting context. So here, what we wants to do is talk about a few different approaches for targeting this particular protein she wants to inhibit and how it's how it happens. So she's mentioning that there are a few different options. However, this review will concentrate on novel treatments targeting and inhibiting telomerase. So rather than general kind of inhibitors, this one, these ones are going to target and that's what she's going to focus on. So she's really set context here for the reader as to what we're exactly going to look at. And that's quite good if you have 20 things to look that could be involved, but you just want to look at maybe eight of them. You can actually find a reason why you would and justify why you're just looking at those those particular sets of, of um, whatever it is you're, you're, you're studying. So on um, page, when she goes through these, she has a Mittelstadt. The title of this whole lit review was focusing on a Mittelstadt. And what she's doing along the way is showing the other alternatives. But she does mention possible difficulties with some of the other approaches or limitations. She said that um, further evaluation is needed in another one. She says here that this was not found to be too efficient because it only worked, uh, gave a slight reduction, obviously, not as strong. So she found problems in all the other versions that she was looking at. And that meant that she could suddenly read the, guide the reader towards the positives of the Mittelstadt research that she had performed. So I think it's very good that she captured limitations and showed that, um, uh, showed that in that way. With regards to how she um, did her citations, I'm sure you've seen as I'm going through, she has quite a lot of citations, which is brilliant. She's referencing all the important statements. And here is one way she's following the DKIT guidelines. She's read a, um, a paper, Diaz and Steen, 2002. And in there, they cited a particular um, manuscript by Veinman. Um, and what she's done here is say Veman et al. 97, which was cited in D. S. and Steen 2002, exactly as you uh, will be guided through the DKIT Harvard referencing guidelines. And then the page 24, I just want to show you what she, where she brought the the reader. So she talked about all these different types of drugs and how they can be. Um, used, she showed limitations, and she brought us to the one that she really had found a lot of potential with. And then she brought us into preclinical trials. So here, she's really bringing us into something that's um, brand new. Um, she's showing us what trials are ongoing. She has information about all the different trials, and then where the trials are, where they're being performed, ongoing, if any results were available, and what the current status is. So that up-to-date information, brand new novel information, is something that's very, very uh, effective, again, if you can include it. I see here as well, another thing worth pointing out is that a lot of you are going to put your citations at the end of sentences. And that's fine. You see here, as a result, induced uh, apoptosis. And then she has the actual citations and the full stop comes after the citation. So that's perfect. However, sometimes you'd like to build that into the sentence just to change the way things read. So look at this sentence here. She says, telomerase independent effects of this GRN163L have also been observed by Mender and colleagues 2013. So you can see that the citation is a bit different, but we're referring to what's in the text. Some other people put it at the start of sentences. For example, Mender and colleagues 2013 in brackets have shown that telomerase independent effects of GRN, you know, and off they go with this. So it's just a nice way to kind of vary how you're citing throughout your text. So that's what I wanted to show you within her review. If I just talk very um, about some general points, throughout her manuscript, there was very high quality of text. Uh, the document was written very professionally and was actually awarded a literacy prize from the DKIT library for her submission. There was excellent use of imagery, figure titles and figure legends. So I thought I could just show you, for example, here, you see she has a particular figure. She has it numbered correctly. 
She has it in bold, the title. She has a citation for where the information came from or was sourced from. And then she has a legend which actually describes the figure. And that's very important to have. All citations were recorded in the reference section. So this is important for any student. If you have, say, 50 citations in your document, there should be 50 citations uh, in completely referenced in the references section. Often, sometimes, um, there can be ones missing. So it's important to do a cross-check before you submit. Excellent sentence structure. There were no overly long sentences. And that's very important that you're not drawing out the reader or getting confused in uh, overly lengthy sentences and uh, ones that are just um, conf almost confusing. She had excellent links between different sections. I've highlighted that in one of the Key, one of the key areas and this improves the flow of the document that you kind of lead the reader into the next section rather than a document become very bitty and disjointed and also she had contained novel and up-to-date information as we've as we've seen with the clinical trial data towards the end it kind of really shows that she was reading novel up-to-date information and from the University of Technology in Sydney I thought this was quite um, relevant that prepare research and write so in preparation think about the question what are you trying to address in your literature review? With regards to research, initially you have to read very broadly and choose a tentative position or an opinion or a plan. And as you get to grips with your real area, you start to read a bit more narrowly, a bit more focused, and then you adopt your position. You have your plan of action about how you're going to structure that report. You know what you really want to stress as the key points. So you start planning, drafting. You might have to go back to do some more research and even change your opinion or how things are going based on this reading. So you might have to reposition different things. Then you might have to redraft and final edit. And as stated in her um, screencast, make sure that you proofread and do any final edits before submission. So I hope you found this effective. The work was of very high quality and I hope this exemplar has given you some ideas as to how you can approach and perform your literature review um, in a very high quality manner. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, Ronan Bree is my name, Department of Applied Sciences, and you can email me on ronan.bree at dkit.ie.